Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you are. Um, we are now in uh, the third or the second topic. No, it is the third topic. Uh, this is the fourth lecture for international business law. Uh, and my name is Catherine Nolan. I think you know me. Uh, hopefully we'll move fairly quick today. Carriage of goods by sea is where we're starting. This week and next week we'll be basically looking at the carriage of goods. Uh, this week we'll focus on by sea and then we'll look at air and land uh, next week. Um, probably the thing to really keep hold of here is that over the last couple of weeks when we talked about commercial contracts, we're talking about the buying and selling of the goods and, or, or services. When we're talking about goods, uh, clearly when there's an international trade in goods, they need to move from the place that uh, they're being sold or the place of origin through to the place where the purchaser is or where the purchaser wants them to go. Uh, so it's a separate contract and we refer to that as a contract of carriage. Um, and, and so basically, as usual, I want to acknowledge a large part of the content here was originally developed by Jonathan Kolob. Um, he included the dad joke reference on the slide. I take no responsibility for that and I'm not going to tell you whether I laughed or not. Um, before we get stuck into Goods by Sea, let's think about what that separate contract of carriage might be. As I mentioned, we can talk about sea, air or land. Um, those are when they are the only forms of transport uh, between or transport, I should say, um, between states. We think of that as a unimodal approach, but there might be a multimodal contract for the uh, carriage of goods. In other words, more than one system or one transport mode might be used. So we can end up with multiple contracts for the carriage of good. Now, if we go back to think about um, the INCO terms, uh, which are a really good way of identifying who's going to be taking the risk and responsibility associated with the movement of the goods from essentially the place of origin through to the place where they're ultimately going to be used. Uh, basically, that could be the vendor who takes responsibility or the seller takes responsibility right up to um, the place of delivery, DAP. Um, or, in fact, the seller might take very little responsibility um, under AXW, for example, X works, uh, and the buyer takes responsibility. So whoever takes responsibility is going to usually be um, a party to these carriage contracts. And again, it might go from trucks to the dock, from the dock to the ship, from the ship to a new port, from the port to another truck, or onto a train uh, and then get transported. So uh, sometimes we might have truck to ship to airport and so on. And there are lots of different players in here. I'd love to say that um, like with uh, all of the work that's been done for uh, commercial contracts, we've got some harmonization and some unification in the way that we approach these things. Unfortunately, that is not the case. We've got many treaties. Uh, each of them approach the question slightly differently uh, and states may or may not be parties to different treaties. So it gets a little bit complex to say the least. Um, it's also important to really think about the market here and what the commercial impact is. Um, this lovely graph on the slide um, uh, basically produced by the UN, um, demonstrates that it's around an 18 trillion US dollar market uh, in the movement of goods alone. Uh, this is basically showing uh, mostly uh, sea routes um, and it's graphically trying to represent uh, basically the change in the corridors of travel over time. So uh, it's showing 2015 through to 2019 
Uh, and it's really interesting to see how much trade, how how prominent China is on that route uh, or in those routes in particular. Um, and I think that's really interesting as we think about who it is that we are doing business with here uh, and because it's that really drives which of the relevant treaties and which of the relevant regimes uh, you need to be paying attention to. Uh, exhibit two here from the same source, and by the way, all the sources will be in the slide pack at the very end. Uh, it's quite likely there will be multiple videos for the same slide pack, but you know how it flows. Um, it's really interesting to see the changes since 2019 uh, until last year, uh, 2023. Really interesting, and um, particularly the reduction in uh, the size of the route between the US and China there. I think that's really interesting. Now, clearly, uh, the pandemic in 2020 and into 21 played a significant impact in the changes, uh, but the market size has maintained um, so you know it's maintained its uh, size significantly. Um, one really interesting resource. Hopefully, it comes up here when I hit my little link. Um, I'm hoping that this records. I can't remember. I love this resource by McKinsey um, because it really allows you to get a sense of where the trading significant trading partners are and what makes sense here. So, um, Australia really doesn't rate. Uh, globally, the total of all goods to Australia, 309 billion, right? That's a lot of money. Um, there's not a problem I have that couldn't be solved by $309 billion, let me tell you. But let's compare that with mainland China, uh, total imports of all go goods to China. We are talking about 250, uh, almost two, two, a little bit of, $2,600 billion worth. And again, we can look at this also as exports. Um, again, China, clearly the significant, most significant player here with um, $3,400 billion worth of trade. Uh, US, over $2,000 billion. Um, even Mexico, the Mexico-US trade uh, is significant in that space. So really interesting. Um, I really like looking at the resources here. I think it gives us a really good sense of the value and the nature of the key relationships. Um, uh, yeah, so I strongly recommend that you have a good kind of play with this website to really get a sense of the market, a sense of some of the patterns. Um, who doesn't love an infographic? So let's get back to the law. That's what we're here for after all. So there are at least uh, five different instruments that you need to be aware of. You don't need to know them off my heart or anything like that, um, but you need to be aware of and understand the interplay between. And I think um, I've, I've tried on the slide here to demonstrate the issues that we have with harmonisation. Now, in relation to Australia and our focus uh, in the upcoming videos, we'll focus particularly on the Hague-Visby rules, but clearly the Hamburg rules are also going to be relevant. Um, so let's just stand back from this for a second and think about what the role of international conventions in uh, contracts for the carriage of good by sea has been. So firstly, clearly, the ambition is standardisation. International conventions, including Hague, Visby and Hamburg, have the objective of standardising practices and legal principles across different jurisdictions and providing a more predictable and uniform legal framework for the international shipping industry. Of course, the fact that we've got two key uh, sets of rules limits that ability to standardise. Um, and essentially, as you work through the reading, you will see uh, that effectively starting with the original Hague Treaty, um, its amendment then with hague Visby, which is what Australia is a signatory to, and then the subsequent Hamburg rules, really the discussion has been around balancing interests. So 
effectively we started with a significant limitation on the liabilities of the carriers uh, and the thinking behind that was effectively well we need it to be economically viable for carriers to be prepared to take treacherous sea voyages to get goods from one place to another to affect globalization and international trade uh, but the original rules really were so limiting the, um, my memory is a hundred pounds uh, and so then Haig Visby uh, provided a calculation or a formula that would amend that um, and then Hamburg which Australia was not a signatory to has has um, push that even further. So the convention seek to balance out the interests over time between the carriers and the shippers or consignees is the term that you will see to ensure that there's a fair allocation of risk, responsibilities and liability. Now with all of the treaties we've looked at so far, part of the obligation or part of the rationale here is legal clarity and predictability. Um, the objective is, uh, or the thought behind it is, that if we establish a clear set of rules for the carriage of good by sea, international conventions will facilitate this smoother commercial transaction by providing legal clarity, predictability for all the parties involved. The more predictable something is, uh, the less risk people are taking, the more likely they are to do it at a reasonable price. Um, again, the treaties in this way, they're facilitating international trade. A standardised legal framework helps reduce disputes and complications in international trade. It encourages efficiency. It reduces costs for participants. Um, but over time, of course, the treaties have needed to adapt to modern practices. So periodic updates, new conventions have basically arisen to adapt to the changes in the nature of maritime transport, Think of the size of uh, ships, for example, uh, and international trade practices, ensuring that the legal effective, well, does it ensure? Looking at my notes, that's the ambition anyway. Uh, the ambition is to have a legal framework that is relevant and effective. So the hate visby rules serve an important function here of regulating the carriage of goods by sea. They are embedded in our carriage of goods by sea legislation. Um, they're distinct in their provisions, particularly regarding the extent of carrier liability and the scope of the application. Choice between sets of rules often depends on the countries involved in the shipping transactions, different nations at signatories to different conventions. The role of the international conventions is critical in providing a cohesive legal structure for one of the oldest and, let's face it, most important modes of international commerce. Um, as we move forward next week, we'll look at air, land and multimodal transportation as well, but this week we'll focus on carriage of goods by sea. So Haig Visby, um, as I mentioned, they're not, and Hamburg, they're really the two key con uh, conventions. Australia's a party to Haig Visby, but not to Hamburg. Uh, so they're not the same thing. They're two distinct set of international rules that have been developed to regulate the carriage of goods by sea. Both sets of rules aim to establish certain legal standards to govern the rights and obligations of carriers and shippers in international shipping. But of course, they differ in terms of scope, application and the extent of carrier liability that they prescribe. Um, so let's have a bit of an overview of what they are. Hague Visby. Hague Visby, as I mentioned before, is an amendment to the original Hague rules. Uh, so that was the International Convention for the Unification of Certain Rules of Law Relating to Bills of Lading, and it was adopted in 1924. Um, the Visby amendments were added to the original Hague rules to update and clarify um, some of the provisions, um, and those amendments came into force in 1968 with a review since additional protocols were added in in 1979. Hague Visby rules set the limitation on the liability of carriers for the loss or damage of goods and they establish rights and obligations of all parties involved in the carriage of goods by sea. Um, key aspects that the, the rules cover include things like carriers' obligations to properly and carefully load, handle, stow, carry, keep, care for and discharge goods that are carried. Uh, now, the John Mo text or the um, Ping Zhong text, depending on whether you're using um, 
the sixth edition or the seventh edition um, have a lot of detail about the history. You do not need to know or understand well, you do need to understand it. You don't need to be able to reproduce it in any way. But understanding the history will help you identify what the issues are, which will be helpful in your overall understanding. Um, we, Even though we're not a party to it, we do need to make sure that we're clear on the differences between Hague-Visby and the Hamburg Rules. So the Hamburg Rules formerly the United Nation Convention on the Carriage of Goods by Sea, uh, was adopted in 1978 and it came into effect in 1992, so, what, 32 years ago. Um, the intention behind them was to modernise and harmonise the rules govern governing the carriage of goods by sea um, and offer a regime that was more favourable to the interests of shippers compared to Hague and Hague-Visby, which are very much more carrier friendly. The Hamburg rules apply to the entire carriage of goods, including any inland transport that forms part of the sea carriage under a single contract. Uh, so that's a significant difference. And they significantly extend the liability the carrier will have for loss or damage to the goods and, the e and ease the burden on the shippers to, prov uh, to prove negligence on the part of the carrier. So Australia, as I mentioned, is a party to Hague-Visby, but not to Hamburg. The current, um, Australia adopted um, Hague-Visby to govern contracts for the Carriage of Goods by Sea and incorporated them into the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act in 1991. Uh, and so when you have a look at the legislation, you will see that it includes um, uh, the the Hague-Visby rules as part of the Act. And the Act applies the Hague-Visby rules as the basis for regulating the rights and obligations of carriers and shippers in international trade. Um, and clearly sea transport is key because whilst um, we have cross-state in interstate trade um, within the Australian Commonwealth, um, international trading is largely by sea. We are an island continent after all. Um, Hague Bisbee has been chosen by a lot of countries, including Australia, as a compromise uh, to the updated and a somewhat expanded liability of carriers compared to the original Hague rules. And they represent a balance between the interests of the carriers and the cargo owners, um, and it's been widely adopted as a consequence. You can compare this with Hamburg, which was an attempt by the UN to basically get a more balanced regime, uh, and although it probably, fa well, it definitely favours cargo owners over the Hague-Visby rules, and one could argue that is pro-cargo owners compared to Hague-Visby, which is pro-carriers. Um, Hamburg rules haven't been as widely accepted uh, as Hague or Hague-Visby for that matter because major maritime nations and shipping interests have been hesitant to accept the increased liability for carriers uh, because of the increased cost. Um, and Australia, like many other countries with significant shipping interests, hasn't ratified the Hamburg rules. Um, the legal framework for the carriage of goods by sea in Australia is based on Hague-Visby, and that reflects a preference for well-established and moderately balanced approach to allocating risk. Um, so we could say that not adopting Hamburg uh, indicates a choice to stick with the more widely recognised traditional Hague-Visby approach. Um, so what happens when an Australian company wants to transport goods to or from countries that are signatories to the Hamburg rules but not to Hague-Visby? Um, how about we make that the topic of the next video and I will see you there. Cheers. 